in John 11 and 12, I find times of glory. Times of glory. And you will look and find a number of places where the word glory and the word glorify are used. Let me point out some of them. John 11, 4 and verse 40. And John 12, verse 13, 23, 28, and 41. With the raising of Lazarus, Jesus is glorified. With the coming of the Greeks, Jesus is glorified. It will be in chapter 12 that he says uh, that uh, he will be lifted up from the earth and draw all men to himself, and that is a time of glory. But times of glory in John 11 and 12. John 11 starts out with Lazarus, the good friend of Jesus, sick, very sick. They live in Bethany, which is a village just two miles to the east of Jerusalem. And uh, his sisters, Mary and Martha, the same Mary and Martha of the famous uh, house where Martha's in the kitchen and Mary is uh, at the foot of Jesus. Um, Mary and Martha are alarmed and worried about their brother. And they send a messenger to find Jesus and call him to rush down and do something to help save their brother because they are worried and rightly so. When Jesus hears that uh, his good friend Lazarus is very, very sick, he does nothing. And the next day, he does nothing. And a second day before finally he says, Okay, let's go down to uh, help Lazarus. Now, that's very, very strange. It's understandable that if, if he just doesn't go, the disciples are aware that it's down at Jerusalem that people are getting ready to try to kill Jesus. But why wait two days and then go? We need to recount our days here and, and think about things get ahead of ourselves in the text. Do you remember the story of Lazarus and when they're ready to raise him from the dead and they're worried about uh, he's been in there and the body is decomposing and stinks? How many days is Lazarus dead when Jesus gets there? Four days. Now what if Jesus had not delayed for two days but had left immediately and come? What would he have found when he got to Bethany? Take away those two days why Lazarus would still have been dead for two days. I'm confident that Jesus knew the timing on this, and there's apparently a good reason why Jesus didn't want to arrive with a two-day corpse, but with a four-day corpse. There was, at that time, a local superstition that uh, when a person dies, the spirit lingers for three days, and then by the fourth day, even the spirit is gone. It would appear that Jesus wanted to make sure for the purposes of creating faith in his followers that this man was totally, irrevocably, completely dead. I do remember that earlier Jesus had raised two other people from the dead. He had raised a little girl, the daughter of Jairus, and she had just died when Jesus got to the house and he went into the room with his disciples, three of them, and the parents, and he brought her back to life. And there was another occasion also in Luke where Jesus uh, raised the son of the, uh, a woman of Nain, a widow, and uh, he had been dead for a few hours enough time that uh, they had washed the body and prepared for the funeral. They had to bury the body within 24 hours, and now they are on their way out to the cemetery when Jesus interrupts the procession and raises this man, now dead for some hours. But Lazarus is going to be four days dead. It's not a body freshly washed and ready, and otherwise looking fine, this is a body already starting to decompose, a body that already is creating the stench of death. As the King James would say, he stinketh. Now, when Jesus is ready to go to Bethany, he tells his disciples, our friend Lazarus sleeps and I'm going to go wake him. 
they misunderstand. The word that Jesus used could be understood as either sleep or death, and they chose sleep, understanding that like an accident victim or something, if now you're resting comfortably, probably you're going to heal up and get well. And they think that if Lazarus is sleeping, that's a good sign. He's going to be fine. We don't need to go down there and put ourselves in peril. But Jesus wasn't talking about sleep sleep. He was talking about dead sleep. And he clarified that then to the disciples. And we're really going to go down there. And it's Thomas, bless his heart, who says, well, let's all go with him so we can die with him. And that may have been just a pessimistic kind of a comment, or it may have been a courageous comment. Maybe we ought to give Thomas the benefit of the doubt, doubting Thomas. And so they get to Bethany, and when Jesus is arriving, it's Martha who first sees him and comes out to greet him and says, I think with a bit of reproach in her voice, at least sorrow, Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. Now that, that's faith that Jesus could have saved him. It's also a bit of reproach that now it's too late to do anything. And Jesus says those wonderful words to Martha in John 11, verse 25 and 26. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? He said to Martha. And she did not exactly say, yes, I believe that. But she said, I do believe that you are the, the Messiah. She did believe in him. She didn't know what to believe otherwise. About that time, uh, Mary, back in the house with the mourner friends, uh, sees what's going on. And uh, she is uh, contacted and they, she tries to slip away quietly to come out and see Jesus. The other mourners in the house see that she's leaving and they assume she's going out to the tomb to do some more mourning, some more wailing, and they want to go with her. A word about funerals as they were conducted in that century. It was customary among the Jews that uh, you were required to have at least two flute players, mournful type of flutes, uh, think Indian flute music, Two flute players and one professional mourner. You had to have at least that. And then you had specific days of deep mourning and lesser mourning and a whole month where you didn't uh, wear anything but uh, black or dark clothes, so on. They had procedures that they went through. And so these mourners thought it was their duty when someone cried to go cry with her. She's gonna wail, we'll go wail with her. And so when she goes out to meet Jesus, she will say the same thing Martha said, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. And they're gonna go from their little meeting place over to where the tomb is. Jesus says, show me where you've laid him. And it's not only the two sisters, but it's all the rest of the crowd that has come out with Jesus. And they go there to that place. And this is certainly one of the most dramatic moments of all the earthly ministry of Jesus. Jesus says, roll away the stone. And Martha, the practical one, says, no. No, Lord. Oh boy, you better be careful when you say, no, Lord. Whatever the Lord says, and you say, no, Lord. But that's what she said. Because he's been there four days, and by now there is an odor, to put it politely, or he stinketh, to put it bluntly but they rolled away the stone. And Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. What do you suppose the crowd was thinking, the mourners? I remember back when he was gonna raise the little girl, they were laughing at him, they were mocking him. Apparently no one said anything this time, but I imagine at least in their minds they were thinking, this man's crazy. He's 
He's just flipped out. What's he doing? Opening a tomb. That's unclean, among other things. And to their amazement, Lazarus comes out. He is bound hand and foot, wrapped up, almost like a mummy, with strips of linen cloth, the way they uh, prepared people for uh, burial in those days. They would take uh, many, many spices and many strips of cloth and start wrapping and putting spice in and wrapping and putting spice in. And here comes Lazarus. And I don't know if he's walking in tiny little steps, if he's floating above the ground. I don't know how he got there exactly, all wrapped up hand and foot. But Jesus said, unbind him and turn him loose. What a miracle. But remember in John 5, Jesus said that the Son has been given the right over life and death, and he can make alive whom he wills. And that's what he did for Lazarus. Verse 50, when Lazarus is raised from the dead, the people marveled, and some of them felt it necessary for whatever reason to go tell on Jesus, go inform the Pharisees. And when the leaders have found out what is going on, it is the chief priest, Caiaphas, who says more than he realizes, because as chief priest, the Holy Spirit inspires him to say something with deeper meaning than he knows. It is better that one man should die than that the whole nation should perish. And they make plans to put Jesus to death. Jesus will die as one for all mankind. Now let's rush on to chapter 12. It is six days before the Passover, and this is the fourth Passover. And between those four Passovers, we have the three years of Jesus' ministry. And it is a Saturday evening, six days before Passover, if I can use my fingers again, if we can count back from Thursday night when Jesus ate the Passover with his disciples, counting on both ends as Jews counted, we'd have uh, Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday, Sunday, and then Saturday. It is Saturday night when uh, they're going to have a banquet in honor of Jesus and Lazarus. And it is uh, a banquet prepared by Mary and Martha. This is not the sinful Mary of Luke 7 that uh, you might have thought. She's not the uh, sinful woman that comes in to weep over Jesus' feet. This is Mary of Mary and Martha and the sister of Lazarus. And she is going to come in not to weep over Jesus' feet, but with a bottle of perfume, a, a large bottle containing a pint, a Roman pint, 12 ounces for us. Uh, and she would break the neck off of that alabaster jar and she would pour this very expensive, precious nard myrrh ointment over his feet. And uh, the whole room is just filled with the smell of all of that that she has poured on his feet and his head. And it is Judas who protests. It is Judas who says, oh, why didn't we sell that perfume for 300 days wages? As many working days as there are in a year. A year's wages we could have had. That may have been an exaggeration, but probably not by much. Judas was not concerned about poor people to sell the money, to perfume and get the money and give it to the poor. No, he was a treasurer. He carried the little flute mouthpiece box, it's a literal uh, translation, in which they kept the handful of coins that belonged to Jesus and the disciples. And he pilfered from that box and he was imagining all those coins in his possession. Terrible thing. But I think all of us probably ought to remember that no gift sincerely given to Jesus is ever a waste. Now maybe, maybe Mary could have done something different with that perfume, but she chose to give it all to Jesus. And Jesus recognized and said, she has prepared me for my burial. He knew within days he would be dead. And he said that wherever the gospel is preached, what this woman has done will be told in memory of her. Now to move along quickly, um, the triumphal 
entry is going to show up here in a few more verses. And people are going to wave palm branches. Why do you tear tree branches down? Because in the days of the Maccabees, the palm branch was put on the coins that the newly freed uh, Jewish nation uh, minted. And it became a symbol of nationalism, national freedom. And uh, palm branches, and they're crying, Hosanna, which means save, save us now. And they come into town. Jesus is the focus point. People expecting him to be the king of the kingdom of David, restored. About this time in verse 20, there are Greeks who come. They've come from a distance. They're not Jews, but they are God-fearers, and they have come to participate sort of as outsiders in the worship of God, and they want to meet Jesus. Interestingly, if you go back through the Gospel of John, a number of times Jesus says, my time has not yet come. Chapter 2 in the miracle of the wine. My time has not yet come, but now for the first time, when the Greeks come seeking him, when the nations have come to see Jesus, he says, now my time has come. It is time for him to be glorified. And he goes ahead to talk about a grain of wheat falling to the ground and growing up. And unless it first dies, it can't then grow. And then he says about himself, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to me. And he said this in verse 33, following verse 32. He said this showing by what manner of death he was to die. To be lifted up is not to be exalted in the book of John. To be lifted up is to be put on a cross. Like John 3.15, we're lifted up like the serpent in the wilderness put on a pole. When Jesus is lifted up, he will draw as a magnetism on the soul of men. He will draw people to him. And if people can watch Jesus die for them on the cross and not be drawn to him, well, I just want to say there is no other plan. There is no other magnetism. There is no other call that will bring Jesus, uh, people to God and bring people to Jesus, except this, that he will die for them on the cross. Now at the end of chapter 12, there is one more thing that mentions in verse 41, that Isaiah was able to see ahead as an inspired prophet. Isaiah called the gospel prophet, Isaiah who spoke a number of things, especially like chapter 53 about the, the lamb led to the slaughter and, and uh, how he, our sins are laid on him and for our, by his stripes we are healed, all of that. Isaiah saw my day. He was able to see the glory of the day of Jesus. That's a beautiful thing, but here's an ugly thing. A couple of verses later in verse 53, or 43, it says that the leaders did not put their faith in Jesus. They did not believe because they loved the glory of men more than they loved the glory from God. That's a literal rendering of the Greek word there for glory. Some versions will translate it, they loved the praise of men more than the praise from God. But either way, it is that some people are more concerned about what will other people think than about what God thinks. And some people would rather have the approval, the praise, the glory of their fellow man than to have the glory that comes from the only God. And these are times of glory. It's time for Jesus to be glorified, and it is time for people to care about the glory of God.